morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you and welcome to the first MS Views and News event in Columbus in 2021. First for anybody, right? Isn't that great? Don't you all feel good about this? Getting out? Hey, we have a virtual audience too, and I want to thank them all for being here online. I am going to take off my mask because I am a good distance away. In this state, we heard, lost their mask mandate, and it's like nobody wears masks anymore. They all went back to normal really quick. Anyway, um, you know, we wanted to let everybody know that MSV is the news. First off, we are the sole supporter of our program that we're doing here today. And we're doing that because, well, you know, a lot of people in the industry are just not ready for these events to happen. But we know about the mental wellness aspect. People do need to get out. They do need to be able to see people again. And we're doing this very comfortably. So if our virtual audience were able to see what you can't, but these tables are about 10, 15, 20 feet apart from each other. There's only four people per table, and we are going to be doing this going forward at least once a month, sometimes twice a month, and we're going to start getting around to rural areas of the country again. All right, so next month, for those that might be online right now, we have a program happening in Jackson, Mississippi at the end of July. At the beginning of August, we'll be in Roanoke, Virginia. The middle of August, Greenville, South Carolina, and the beat goes on. In September, we'll be in Atlanta, Georgia, and in Detroit, Michigan, all right, or just north of Detroit in a more rural area. But uh, yeah, the point is that people need to be educated. They need to be able to get out again. They need to hear what they need to know about multiple sclerosis, because a lot of people just forget. So we want to remind them of what it is that they need to know about. And we have excellent speakers like Dr. Boster, who will be going around. In fact, Dr. Boster is going to join us in Roanoke, Virginia, to do the event over there. So I don't want to take up a lot of your time, all right? I don't want to take up a lot of your time at all, but today's program is about the invisible symptoms of multiple sclerosis, how to make MS boring, a little bit about MRI, a little bit on disease progression, and Dr. Boster, who's an expert at being able to do all this, is going to do a wonderful job today. And like I said to you all earlier, I will be going around the room at the end of the program to take questions. And for all of you online, a lot of you, when you registered for this program, you wrote in your questions, and we do have that, and I will be asking those questions. But if you are online and you have questions, there's a box on the screen. At the top of the page, there's a, like a reddish-orange box. All you do is click on that, you type in your question, and we, we, when we get to the Q&A, we will be asking those questions as well. Please do not feel that you are blocked by being virtual, all right? You, we'll, answer, we'll ask your questions as much as we'll ask everything in here. And for everybody in the audience, if you have a question, please raise your hand, get me to acknowledge that I see you, that you have a question, I'll come over and get your question from you. Okay? In the meantime, for those that don't know Dr. Boster, well, he's been around a long time, and we've been uh, doing events with Dr. Boster now for almost eight years, when he started our first one in Cincinnati, Ohio, and I'm sure he's going to come running up on the stage similarly to get started on this one. So let's welcome Dr. Boster. Come on and say howdy to all. Howdy. Thanks, Stuart. Howdy do. You're out of practice. <laughs> All right, so for the next hour, we're going to be engaged in some audience participation exercises. For example, I'm going to say howdy, and then I want you all to say howdy back. Make sense? All right, let's just try it. Howdy! howdy. There you go. That makes me feel so much better. How is everyone today? Good. Everyone turn around, look at the camera, wave to the people on the interwebs. Hello, people on the interwebs. I am so excited that MS Fusion News has come back up to sunny Columbus, Ohio. And I just want to highlight what they're doing because it's a really big deal. They share my passion for educating, empowering, and energizing families impacted by MS. And during this global viral pandemic, an organization that traditionally goes out into communities wasn't able to go out into communities. What do they do? They did everything virtually, and I think that's a really big deal. Now, this is the very, very first hybrid live program they're doing this year. And so let's say thank you to MS Visa News of choosing Columbus, Ohio for that event. <laughs> Stuart asked me to talk about something which has been on my mind a lot recently, and that's the concept of the invisible nature of multiple sclerosis. 
I haven't really done very many lectures on the invisible nature of multiple sclerosis. So this morning, I took the pizza box that I devoured last night, and on the back of it, I wrote a lecture. So I figured I'd bring this with me, and this will be my notes. <laughs> Now, when we talk about the invisible nature of MS, that means a whole bunch of things. Be careful, this is now an audience participation moment. Each table can elect one person you can voluntold to share with me, when I say invisible aspect of MS, what do you think of? Make sense? So why don't we start over here. Who is gonna share with me one aspect of MS which seems invisible? Shout something out. Don't worry, the entire interweb is looking at you. Depression. Depression is very, very common in the setting of multiple sclerosis. In fact, people impacted by MS are twice as likely to experience depression compared to the general population. What does someone look like when they're depressed? They look like they're not depressed, right? They, they don't look any different. Honey, you look fine. Well, you look fantastic. And it's an excellent example of a symptom which is invisible. And we'll come back to symptoms that are invisible. Thank you for that. How about over here? Cognition. Cognition. Cog fog, the leading cause of loss of work in MS is not because you can't walk. No, the leading cause of loss of work in MS is from cognitive fatigue and from difficulty with thinking and memory. But to look at you from the outside, honey, you look so good. Since you're having trouble processing. That's a really big deal and it's an invisible deal. How about back here? Numbness. Numbness. So, when I wake up and I've slept like this and my hand is numb, I train myself to try to use that hand when I brush my teeth or do something with or even use my phone because it's a fleeting opportunity to have slight insight into what someone might experience to have their hand be numb all the time. And it's really, really frustrating. And I can't fathom what it might be like to be like that all the time. And honey, you look fine. You don't look numb. Well, you don't look uninformed. <laughs> so how about back here? Something that's invisible. Fatigue. fatigue. So cog fog and fatigue sit locked together at the very top of symptoms amongst MS. It is the most common symptom in multiple sclerosis fatigue and it is the least understood, not just by doctors but by family members. You ever done the experiment where you go to your spouse and say, hi, I'm tired. Nine times out of the ten the response is, yeah, me too because they are, but they may not understand the degree to which you are fatigued. I try to describe it to people saying, if you went to work on Monday and then didn't go to bed at night, and then Tuesday you, you worked all day, and then you didn't go to bed at night, and then Wednesday we went for a walk and talked about what it's like to feel tired, and you're just trying to keep your head up and keep your eyes open, keep walking forwards. Maybe that's what it feels like. Fatigue is a big one. How about over here? Yes. So you may have visual disturbances, but they can't see that. And, and that's all too common. There are so many different ways that MS can affect vision. That's an excellent point you bring up. How about over here? An invisible aspect of MS, something that catches your attention. Pain. Thank you for bringing that up. When I went to medical school two years ago at the University of Cincinnati, that was a joke. Thank you for laughing inside. When I went to medical school, they told me that MS didn't cause pain. And I actually raised my hand in class and said, I think that's wrong. And he said, you're wrong, sit down. My professor knew better. But my uncle, who had MS, complained of pain all the time. I didn't think he was making it up. He wasn't making it up. There's all kinds of pain in MS, and we're going to talk about that tonight. And it is absolutely invisible. How about over here, a table of two, something that's invisible in the aspect of MS? Yes. That should be maybe number one. Everything we're going to talk about tonight, the sheer, or today, the sheer fact that it's invisible is infuriating. When the doctor says you're stable, except you can't do the things that you could do two years ago. He said, your MRI looks fine. Well, why am I dropping all the stuff in the house, right? I mean, this is very, very common and it's frustrating and we'll talk about that. And my two favorite ladies in the back of the room, what might you bring to the table as far as something that's invisible in the setting of MS? Fair, fair, yep. We, I will comment, one of the reasons I absolutely love a, a, a community like this is together as a whole, 
we have our fingers on the pulse of the disease. That's not uncommon that the very last table says, you know what, the stuff they said was accurate. And, and I just, I want to reflect on the fact that people impacted by MS, patients, care partners, family members, are a group of people that seek out understanding. And, I, and I, I really, really appreciate that because that makes you such a better partner in your care. All right, so let's check out lecture topic number one. And I'm not being sponsored by this pizza place, <laughs> although it was really tasty. So the first thing I wrote down was diagnosis. The diagnosis of MS is sometimes a bit invisible. So a human being is out living their best life and they have a bug in their eye, except they rub it and they're still there, so they ignore it. And the next day they can barely see and it starts to hurt when they move their eye. And so they don't know they have optic neuritis, they just know something's weird about their eye. And so then they go see their optometrist who says, Rrr. and then that optometrist sends them to an ophthalmologist who says, hmm, I think we need to get an MRI. And then they get the MRI results, they say, yeah, I think you need to see a neurologist. Then you see the neurologist says, hi, you have MS, pick which drug you want to start. Pause. We just got an invisible diagnosis. <laughs> Can we back up a little bit? I'll share with you, as I meet new families with MS and we talk about their disease, I always start by going through how I confirm their diagnosis. Continually, my heart is broken when someone says these words, doctor, no one has ever shown me my MRI. I've never seen my MRI. Nobody ever explained it to me. That's not fair. It's your $3,000 of insurance money. It's your brain. Well, they gave me a disc, but I don't know how to read it. So, so let's talk a little bit about how to make the invisible nature of the MS diagnosis visible. Sound like a plan? I'm so glad you agree, because otherwise I'd have to come up with a different topic. <laughs> so there are five elements to making an MS diagnosis. The first element is your story. Although in medicine, we have to use different words because it sounds cooler if we say the history of present illness, right? So your story, like the stuff that happens to you, it's the stuff you tell me about. And when it boils down to brass tacks, what am I listening for? I'm listening for the discrete onset of something bad that happened to you that lasted for a little while and then maybe got a bit better. I'm trying to listen for an attack or, and, I'm also listening for a slow, steady decline in neurological function that's not explained by something else. The entire time we're talking, as I'm going through the first consultative visit, that's what I'm listening for. And as you tell me about an event, I'm trying to, to see if that event sounds like what I've heard for the last decade and a half when people have an attack with MS. And, and I'm asking clarifying questions. When did it start? How long did it last? When did it peak? How bad did it get? What else was going on? Did you have a fever? I'm trying to clarify the elements of the story which are consistent with an MS attack or progression of neurological disability. That's number one. Now, if I talk to 20 new families in a busy week, I will hear 20 different stories, 20 different experiences. It's all MS. That's confusing. That's frustrating. When you have a heart attack, it's pretty much the same thing. It's very, very scary. It's very, very bad. It can kill you, but it's not very complicated. You don't have to go questioning the fact that, you know, there's an elephant sitting on your chest and it's hard to breathe. But the MS presentation is so varied that there isn't a classic presentation. There's a host of what they could be. And that makes you feel like you might even say to yourself, am I, am I making it up? You're not making it up. That's the first of five things. What are the other four? The second one is what we see on neurological examination. So when I have you do the MS Olympics and we're doing the walking test and I'm having you hop and I want you to do this and do this and do this and I want you to follow my finger. That's not just a form of amusing torture that the doctor does to you because it's funny. And that's not a, a ritual like you might see in a different environment. No, that's me looking for evidence on your neurological exam to support what you told me. Now, the reason I bring that up, the reason that's important is because that's visible. But MS is a sport of subtlety. Neurology is a sport of subtlety. 
you don't need to go to the doctor if you can't move your arm. Like it doesn't, it doesn't take like a medical professional to be like, that doesn't work very well, right? Nothing is that obvious, oftentimes. And so just to give you an example, if you, if you have a stroke, God forbid, or a cerebral palsy, or really, really affected by MS, you might see someone whose hand is like this. Have you seen that before? Um, someone whose hand is kind of curled in like this. This pattern of damage is caused by damage to the brain, not the muscle. And very early on, the person doesn't present like this. What happens is we have them flip their hands over, close their eyes and turn their head. Now watch my left hand, guys. Their hand will do that. That's it. That little tiny drop is the beginnings of this. And I'm looking for that drop, that subtle drop to tell me this arm is weak, not because the muscle's weak, but because the brain that's feeding it information isn't working very well. And when they tell me, hey, a couple months ago, my left arm didn't work very well, I'm looking for subtle things, visible things, to help me diagnose. Does that make sense? Yeah. Number three is the MRI. Boy, it's fun to crawl into a tube where they lock your head in a cage and strap you down and tell you, sir, please stop breathing for three hours <laughs> while the loudest noises in the universe are going bang, 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 and it's dark and you can't move. In case you haven't picked up on this, I'm a little claustrophobic in a scanner. Unfortunately, it is the single most useful biomarker to diagnose multiple sclerosis. It is so relevant that in the modern era, the diagnostic criteria we use are predicated on MRI changes. Every once in a blue moon, someone has symptoms of MS, but because of one thing or another, they're not able to have an MRI. It makes diagnosing them really challenging. Truth. And that MRI is taking a picture of structure, like the, if you took a picture of someone's house. It's a structure. You're taking a picture of that structure, and you're looking for structural damage. Just like when a home inspector might inspect a home, and he or she may look to make sure there isn't structural damage to the house, the neurologist has ordered an MRI of your brain and spinal cord, the supercomputer that runs your body, and the superhighway that moves all the information back and down to look for structural damage. And so we look for spots. Ooh, there's some spots. What's a spot? Well, spot is a colloquial term for a T2 hyperintense lesion. What's that in English, Aaron? It's a dot. It's a white spot on your MRI. It represents an area where there's an increased puddle of water. From what cause? Well, if you notice, the MRI doesn't have like a label with an arrow with an answer. So we are trained to look at the size of the spot, the shape of the spot, the location in the brain, how it responds when you give contrast dye, and how it responds when you repeat the study a little bit later. Those are the aspects and elements. Those are the visible principles that allow us to diagnose MS lesions. So my point here is, as we start to collect information, I've got a story that sounds a lot like MS. I've got subtle but real exam findings that support the story, and now I have a brain and a spinal cord MRI that have the trappings of MS with lesions in classic locations. But there's five things, and that's only three. Number four is everyone's favorite, a spinal tap. I can't tell you, people line up and they said, I demand that you do a spinal tap today. And I say, no, no, I don't want to. They say, you must. Never, ever have I heard that. Um, it's not remotely fun to even think about someone sticking you with a needle and taking out fluid you didn't know you had and sending it off to the laboratory. But 90-some percent of people impacted by MS have changes on their spinal fluid. Now, that means the 10% don't. But if we were to obtain spinal fluid and we see those objective, black and white, clear as day changes, we know that your immune system is overly active. And it's very likely in the setting of someone with the right story and the exam to support the right story and the MRI with the spots, if they have abnormal spinal fluid, we're now starting to visualize a diagnosis. We're starting to see the diagnosis. What's number five? Excellent question. Thank you for asking. It's, oh yeah, Aaron, prove it's nothing else. Now, my mentor used to say in his thick Pakistani accent, that if you wrote the differential diagnosis of MS, so like all the different things it could be, with a marker at the top of the wall, he'd get to the bottom of the floor and need a new marker and he wouldn't be done yet. Because there are many, many things that can imitate and mimic MS, and that makes it challenging. But that's my burden, not yours. 
that's part of my job is to help make sure that I cross all the other stuff off the list. My point in sharing those five things with you is to help you have some insight into how we make the diagnosis visible. It's my strong opinion that if you have MS, you can demand that I prove it to you. I actually like it when patients say, I don't think I have MS, doc, prove it to me again. Because typically they're saying that because they're doing really well. So yay, that's a good problem for me to have. And I should be able to answer that question adequately. I should be able at any point in time to go back and show you the exam findings, show you the spinal fluid results, show you your MRI, and help you and your family understand how you, the diagnosis was clarified. Make sense? All right, we're gonna change topics. So if you have questions about how to make the diagnosis visible, kind of keep them fresh in your mind or maybe jot yourself down a note. And at the end of our five hour lecture today, as you're getting ready to go home and go to bed, then we'll ask those questions. No, I'm not gonna take that long. All right, let's consult the pizza box. Symptoms, all right, let's talk about symptoms. This is a very useful pizza box. So many symptoms are invisible. It's profoundly frustrating. And I'll tell you something. Some neurologists dislike managing people with MS because it frustrates them because they can't see it. And some people are very boxy thinkers and if they can't see it, then it must not be real or they just don't want to deal with it. I've heard that many, many times. So you see the MS patient, Aaron, it confuses me. I don't, I don't understand it. I'm serious. So let's start to talk about symptoms. MS is an autoimmune condition that affects the supercomputer that runs the body, the holiest of holies, the brain, and the superhighway, the spinal cord that moves everything up and down. And so if you ask the question, could MS cause blank, the answer is yes. It's actually kind of a bad question because it could be always yes. And so we do look for certain patterns of symptoms and some of the most bothersome symptoms are absolutely invisible. People don't stop working typically because they can't walk. You can be very effective working, not walking. People stop working because of invisible symptoms like thinking and memory and fatigue as mentioned over here. Pain as mentioned over here. These are, these are real world problems that real people have. Several people in this room I know have them, but you can't see it because honey, you look so good. So let's talk about a series of symptoms that are invisible but very, very real. And then let's talk about how we can make them visible. So I want to start by talking about the up there's. What are the up there's? I ask every patient, how are the up there's? I'm talking about thinking and memory, energy and mood. That's a triad of symptoms that are tied together with twine. Because if one gets bad, it impacts the other two. And if one gets better, it helps the other two. Those symptoms are extremely common in multiple sclerosis and they're invisible to the outside observer. They're also invisible to the unattentive doctor. What do I mean by that? Hey, how are you? Are things going okay? You look fantastic. Oh, wonderful. Anything going on? Do you need refills? It was lovely seeing you, honey. What did I forget to do? I forgot to ask any questions. I forgot to shut up. I forgot to let her open up her mouth and say words. I forgot to listen. And unfortunately, that cocktail party speech happens way too often in medicine. I know folks that see MS patients every 15 minutes. Breaks my heart. It takes me 15 minutes to get your jacket off, bring you a cup of coffee, sit down, look at pictures of your kids before we can start talking about anything. And so let's think about these up there's. Let's think about thinking and memory, energy and mood. How do we make those invisible symptoms visible? One way, miraculous, is to ask the human. I find this to be the very best way. See, you're a you expert. You know all about you. You know about you better than anyone else on the planet, even your mom and your wife. You're a you expert. Don't let them tell you different. And if I ask you how you're doing with your thinking and memory, and I listen, oftentimes you'll tell me the answer. I give this a lot, I'm okay. I'll say, are you really okay? You're being polite. I'm just being polite. How are you really doing? Horrible. Let's start there. And I can ask you if you're having trouble with thinking and memory. And then I can help clarify it by saying, is it just your spouse telling you that you don't remember what she said? Or are you noticing it in other venues, like in the workplace? Are you getting written up? Are you having more problems doing stuff that you didn't have problems doing? Are you taking more notes than you used to? So I can ask questions. 
I can also ask questions about energy levels. I can ask questions about mood. But I want to kick it up a notch. So many of you that are familiar with my clinic, before you come in, whether it be virtual or in the office, we ask you to fill out a couple forms. Those forms are not airy-fairy. Those forms are validated patient reported outcome measures. Doctor talk for a survey about how you're doing. And I use specific surveys that screen for cognitive impairment, fatigue, and depression. The triad of the up there's. Almost every single visit. And I look at those results and it gives me insight into how you're doing. And so that's a powerful tool. What's another way that we can make the up there's visible? Neuropsychometric testing. Who here has heard of neuropsychometric testing before? Some of you are lying. All right, so some of you have heard of neuropsychometric testing. So neuropsych testing is the real deal holy field of IQ tests and memory tests. It's a pa paper and pencil battery that takes three to eight hours to administer, sometimes over one or two days. It's done by a, a, a neuropsychometric expert who is specifically trained and boarded in this area. And it gives you tremendous insight into the depth and breadth of difficulty with thinking and memory. It tells us if there's issues with, say, anxiety, which is impacting your cognition, or depression, which is impacting your fatigue. It's extremely valuable information. And so sometimes we need to get formal neuropsychometric testing so that we can flush out some of these things that seem invisible but are visible. Now, having an eight-hour pencil and paper test on a Saturday doesn't sound very much fun, and it's not a, something that all humans have access to because neuropsychologists are harder to find than MS neurologists. And so there's other things that we can do. For example, when you come to my clinic, we do the matching quiz. You love the matching quiz, right? I get out a stopwatch, I give you 90 seconds to fill in all the bubbles, go! And you're filling out the matching quiz. And we're looking at the number that you attempt to do and the number that you get right, and we can follow that over time. A score below 40 is concerning, and a four-point drop from one clinic visit to another is statistically and clinically relevant. That's a 90-second matching quiz that teaches me whether or not there's a screening concern on the table for cognition. Why am I bringing this up? Because the up there's are invisible, and I'm trying to share with you ways that I try to make them become visible. Well, if we're going to talk about the up there's, we've got to talk about the down there's. What are the down there's? You know the down there's. Bowel, bladder, and sexual function. And so, bowel, bladder, and sexual function are very commonly affected in MS. And they are the leading cause of poor quality of life in MS. Adults do not like to wet their pants in public. Adults do not like to be incontinent of stool. And most adults do not enjoy difficulties in the bedroom. And yet, this is very, very common, and it's stigmatizing, and for some it's embarrassing. And when you're at the doctor's office and he's spending four minutes with you, you might not want to bring it up. But it's a really big deal. And so it's invisible to the outside observer. Sometimes it's invisible to your spouse. Do you know, I have patients that confide in me that they're unable to achieve orgasm and they've hid it from their spouse because they don't want to hurt his feelings. That makes me sad because we can fix that. Some people refuse to go out because they're concerned they'll lose their bladder. And so they don't go to church anymore. They don't go out of their house to go to their friend's house or to go out to dinner or lunch because they're concerned they'll wet themselves. And my point here is make me aware of that problem so that I can intervene and help you because we can help. There are all kinds of things we can do. It's all predicated on, you tell me that there's a problem. So every time you come in, we ask screening questions about bowel, bladder, and sexual function. Why do I talk so much about sex? Because I live in the real world. And it's an a excellent aspect of life. And when it's impaired, it ruins the quality of our life. And in polite culture, we don't talk about that. But my office is not polite culture. <laughs> Not if you're sitting with me. <laughs> we, um, we recently interviewed, <laughs> I shouldn't tell you this, so it's fun to tell you. We recently interviewed someone to work at the Boster Center for MS, 
And my business manager, who's a wonderful, wonderful man and very, very proper, said, now there's one aspect of the team that I need you to be familiar with. Um, you have to be comfortable with flowery words sometimes coming out of Dr. Boster's mouth. <laughs> um, and so if you hear those flowery words that start with letters like F and S, um, we just need to make sure you're okay with that. <laughs> so, so God bless him. And I think the lady said that she was, but I just thought that was really funny. Um, we talked about the up there's, we talked about the down there's, but I want to talk about pain. Remember my professor said MS doesn't cause pain? He was really, really wrong. Because there are probably eight to 10 different kinds of pain that are unique to multiple sclerosis. And nobody else can see them. Trigeminal neuralgia, facial pain, is some of the most severe pain that a human being can experience. It sometimes culminates in suicide, it hurts so bad. Very, very serious. Did you know that this year there was a paper that came out that suggested that people with MS are 14 times more likely to experience trigeminal neuralgia? Not twice as likely, 14 times as likely to experience trigeminal neuralgia compared to the general population. But nobody can see it. It feels like someone is stabbing you in the face, but nobody can see it. And so sometimes people will say, am I making this up? No, you're not making it up. It's very, very real. It's just not available to the outside observer. Optic neuritis, the example I gave you when I started talking, where you lose vision, and if you ask the person a question, does it hurt when you move their eye? They say, oh my gosh, how did you know that? As the optic nerve swells, it's tight inside of a bony canal, and as you bend your eye, it tugs on it, and it hurts like the dickens. If you have transverse myelitis, so your spinal cord becomes inflamed from an MS attack, that doesn't just have to affect bowel and bladder and strength, it can affect sensation. And it can cause all kinds of weird pains and phantom pains. Probably the most annoying is itching. Itching is a form of pathologic pain, and it can happen from spinal cord damage. And I'll see patients that have excoriated, meaning they scratch themselves to bleeding on their arms or their legs. They didn't even know that that was caused by their multiple sclerosis. They didn't even tell anyone about it because they didn't put two and two together. It's an invisible symptom and they didn't know how to interpret it. Anyone ever heard of the MS hug? The only hug you don't want? So the MS hug is a terrible, terrible symptom. The very first time it happens, most people end up in the ER. They're getting worked up for a heart attack, God forbid. They're getting worked up for pulmonary embolisms, all kinds of other scary words. And the doctor says, and I hear this all the time, there's nothing wrong with you. Oh, really? Because I feel like I'm dying. No, no, there's nothing wrong with you. What they should say is, there's nothing wrong with your heart. But all too often, the patient says, I went home, I begged for pain control. I begged, they thought I was seeking pain medicine because my heart and lungs were fine. And it's not until they come to see us and we image their spinal cord and show them the lesions that they start to realize, no, no, they weren't making it up. The, the MS hug is caused by damage to the spinal cord that controls the nerves around your ribs. Yeah, now, at the risk of enhancing your meal, you ever had ribs, like barbecue ribs? All right, so you got the bone, then you got the meat, then the bone, you're eating the meat. Those are intercostal muscles. Those are the muscles between the ribs. And what happens with an MS hug is the nerve is fired because the spinal cord is goofy and it tells the nerves to clamp down those muscles. And so the reason you feel like you're being squeezed is you are being squeezed by the intercostal muscles between your ribs. And it hurts like the dickens. But you look fine. You look just fine, there's no problem. Checked out your heart, your heart's fine. Honey, there's nothing wrong with you. I hate that. I wanna say, yeah, you just didn't know where to look, doc. <laughs> so the MS hug is another example of a symptom which is unique to multiple sclerosis. I could go on and list about eight or nine other symptoms. In fact, if I use my small cheat sheet that I've hidden from you, now we've covered most of the stuff on there. Now I wanna talk about one more symptom which is insidiously invisible. Weakness. Now you can say, wait, 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 Aaron. We're talking about invisible symptoms. If your arm or leg's weak, I can see that. That's not what I mean exactly. Most people, when they think of a weak arm or a weak leg, they think about something like a stroke. So if my leg is weak from a stroke and it's weak and then that kind of just, that's the way it is and now it's weak. MS is way more complicated than that. Allow me to explain. If you have weakness from MS and it's February in Ohio, it's kind of cold outside, it's kind of cold inside, 
those weak muscles are at high risk of having spasticity. So now, it's not so much that you're weak, it's that your leg cramps up and spasms. And your Charlie horse, right? And your spouse may say, well, geez, Louise, you didn't have that problem yesterday. What's going on with her? Well, it wasn't cold yesterday. And so the character of her weakness changed. The change was invisible to the outside observer. It's the temperature. Let's take that same human being with a weak leg. Let's make it August in Columbus. Isn't it great having seasons? Now it's hot outside. She's not spastic. She gets weaker because she has heat sensitivity and motor fatigue. And so now she's dragging more. Well, you weren't dragging more yesterday. What's wrong with you? Is she making it up? No, it wasn't hot yesterday. See my point? There are many, many aspects of weakness that are invisible and confusing. Someone over at this table mentioned visual problems. It's real hard to navigate if you can't see very well. And you may walk funny because you can't see. Or because it's not that you can't see like you're blind, but you're seeing double and things are distorted or they're not clear. And so you misstep and tumble and fall. Oh, that was weakness. No, not really. It's because your vision didn't work. So my point here is MS symptoms are real, but they're not always visible to the outside observer. And the take home is that doesn't make them less real just because they're not able to see it. And how do we get around this? How do we address this? Well, I shared with you some tools that I use, for example, in clinic to look at the up there's. I'll share a couple tools that we look at the down there's. I can ask you those questions. I have a bladder ultrasound machine. I can use the bladder ultrasound to see how well you empty your bladder and see if there's any urine retaining. I can make that bladder urgency visible by measuring it before and after you go to the bathroom. Let me tell you the very, very best way to make MS symptoms visible. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Tell your doctor. Like seriously, t just tell your doctor. Just say, hey doc, today I absolutely must tell you about my pain. That's what I want to discuss with you today. And if they say blah, 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 say no, 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 remember, I, I, I want to talk about my pain. Now here's a, a secret which only the people in this room and everyone on the interweb will know. Write it down. There's a magic trick. If you bring a piece of paper to the doctor's office and you walk in and say, doctor, I have notes. Hey, I have five questions. She is ethically obligated to let you read it. Seriously, try it. Actually, MS Views and News, if you go on their website, they can download the form they've created exactly for this purpose. Or you can go old school and just rip out a piece of paper and write down your questions. Bring it to the doctor and say, before I leave today, I want to go through these five things. And then when the doctor says, okay, honey, I'll see you. They say, no, no, we're not done with number four. I, I need to ask you one more question, remember? Is that something that you would be comfortable doing? Good. If you're not comfortable, that's okay, but I want you to... I want you to push yourself a little bit. Every person with MS needs an advocate, every single person. And the best advocate to cultivate is yourself because you're a you expert. And so I really, really want you to be comfortable coming in with a list of questions or a list of concerns. Write them down, say, I need to talk to you about this. The other advantage is that way you're less likely to forget. Make sense? Let's consult the pizza box. Prognosis and treatment effect. This is arguably one of the most confusing and frustrating, to use the gentleman's words, aspect of multiple sclerosis. Prognosis is the attempt at guessing the future. And we neurologists are not good at it. We're not good at prognosticating. Sometimes people think we are. Like I have a wizard's hat and a crystal ball, and I kill a chicken, and I look into it, and I can tell you what's gonna happen. That's not true. <laughs> But there are certain attempts at prognostication. There are certain aspects of your clinical presentation, your demographic presentation, your early MRIs that predispose one human to be more likely to have a bad outcome compared to another. So it's not completely invisible, the future. I will give you an example of two human beings, both with early MS, 
and I'll share with you that one of them is prognostically less likely to have aggressive disease, where the other one is more likely to have aggressive disease, okay? So over here we have a 23-year-old Caucasian woman with no comorbid conditions. She is an athlete, she eats clean, doesn't smoke cigarettes, doesn't really drink very much, poor gal. And she has an optic neuritis, and it gets better without steroids. This gets better on its own. We get an MRI, her spinal cord is clean. She has no lesions on her spinal cord. The base of her brain, clean. There's no spots at the base of her brain. She has three spots up in her head. One enhances. She's diagnosed with MS by the skin of her teeth. That woman's prognosis is actually very favorable. Now that's not a guarantee, but, it, but it's actually very favorable. Over here, let me present a Hispanic gentleman who's 42 years of age. He presents with both weakness and bowel incontinence. Same time. His leg's weak and he has difficulty in the bathroom. And when you get an MRI, he has lesions on his spinal cord. He has lesions at the base of his brain. He also has early diabetes and high blood pressure. And he used to smoke cigarettes. He stopped only recently. That gentleman is a scary, scary scenario for an MS neurologist because he has many, many prognostic factors that predispose that he's gonna go on to have more aggressive disease. My point here is not to contradict myself and say that's my crystal ball, but my point is to share, when I meet you, there are certain aspects that predispose me to be more or less concerned about how well you're gonna do in the future. And so there is some information. Very often, when I meet a family in consultation, someone who has been around other docs or what have you, and I talk about their prognostic factors, there's an emotional response. Something to the effect of, why am I hearing this for the first time today? Why did the other doctors not tell me that? Are you sure, Dr. Boster? I saw so-and-so who's very fancy, and they didn't say that. And I try really hard not to guess what other doctors think or do, because sometimes it confuses the hey-hey out of me. But I know the data, and I know what's relevant as I try to help you live your best life despite having MS. And I also don't pull punches and I don't lie. And so I'm just gonna be very blunt and say here are the things that make me concerned. And it does make me sad when someone says I've never heard that before, but you need to hear that. And just like I want you to bring a list to your doctor's office and say hey, these are things I wanna talk about. Just like you may demand at any time to have your diagnosis confirmed, it's also fair to say prognostically what do I have going on doc? Now, there are tools that we can use, and I want to break them down a little bit. One of the most useful tools in 2021 is the MRI. Because the change across time on the MRI is a very strong indicator of what's going to happen down the line. If you, for example, are taking one of those first-line therapies that we used to give people a shot, and in the first two years you have one new spot, you are predetermined to fail that shot down the road. We didn't used to know that. When I was in training, one spot a year was acceptable because our drugs weren't very good. <laughs> but what we have learned is, if you have a new spot in the first two years when you're taking those shots, you are predisposed to not do well clinically down the line. That's very, very disconcerting. Another very helpful tool on the MRI is to measure your brain volume. The other thing that I wanna talk about after we get through the MRI is about the confusing and visible nature of the MS medicines. But just a couple more words about, about the MRI and about brain volume. When we get an MRI, many of you know to ask about the white spots. Are there any spots? Typically you mean the white spots. But that's not the only piece of information that we can learn. And one of the most valuable pieces of information is the size of your brain. Because after the age of 18, and most everyone here is, I have a terrible truth to tell you. Your brain is pre-programmed to get smaller every year. Just like we get shorter as we age. When I was 20, I was six foot even. And I've gotten smaller as I've aged. Or just as our skin gets thinner as we age, our brains shrink as we age. That's supposed to happen. And it's supposed to be 0.2% a year or less. In MS, that can be accelerated 10 times faster. And brain volume loss is one of the best predictors of long-term disability. 
and of cognitive impairment. And if I meet you and you already have the trappings of brain shrinkage, that is a bad prognostic factor. And as we get an MRI from point A to point B to point C, we can compare the rate at which your brain is shrinking. And that is a massive indicator to me about how we're doing. That's taking the concept of prognosis and trying to make it somewhat visible. I want to shift gears and move away from the concept of prognosis and I want to talk about therapeutic response. This is arguably one of the most frustrating areas for MS patients, the darn drugs. Now I, I want to start off by separating drugs into three categories. One category of drugs are what we take when we have an MS attack, steroids, IVIG, stuff like that. That's not what I'm talking about. All right, so I'm not talking about those medicines. There are a host of medicines that we take to help symptoms. I have a pill for almost every ill. We can treat the up there's. We can treat the down there's. We can treat the spasticity and the heat sensitivity. We can treat the pain. Those are all symptomatic treatments. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the disease modifying therapies. I'm talking about the medicine that's supposed to slow your disease down. And this is very confusing. And to the human taking the medicine, it can feel like their medicine is invisible. It's not really doing anything. And that's because of a concept that I want you to learn called therapeutic lag. Therapeutic lag is a critical concept to understand MS and to understand MS therapeutics. If you have a headache and you take an aspirin, you have an expectation that your headache gets better in about 15 minutes, right? I have a headache, I take an aspirin, 20 minutes later I'm better, good. And if 20 minutes, 15 minutes go by, my headache's still there, that medicine didn't work. I need another aspirin or a Tylenol or whatever, right? And to be honest with you, most red-blooded Americans, that's how they think of all medicines. They expect to see some immediate outcome that teaches them that it's working well, which is reasonable. But the MS medicines don't work like that, not the disease-modifying therapies. Check it out. If I give you an MS DMT today, it's going to change the course 5, 10, and 15 years from now. It's not going to change what goes on today. Let me use a different example. If you have three children and you start oral birth control, you still have three children. <laughs> they didn't go away. And my joke is, if you want to know why you're taking birth control, go hang out with your three kids. <laughs> I'm just joking. Max, my son over there. You take a birth control pill to prevent an unplanned event. To prevent an unplanned addition to your family. That's why you're taking a birth control pill. And the MS medicines are kind of like birth control pills against bad outcomes in MS. And if you take an MS medicine, you may have side effects, which make you feel yucky. And very often I, I hear someone say, Doc, I don't want to take your medicine. I'm feeling better off the medicine than on the medicine which may be the case, but that's not why I'm giving it to you. I'm not giving it to you to make you feel better now. Bluntly, I'm giving it to you to keep you walking in 20 years. That's a really, really important concept because if you don't understand that concept, you may think the MS medicine is not working. Now, how do we know that it's working? How do we know that? Well, there's one way I figured out. If I could simply clone you. So if I could clone you, and I'd have to get written permission from your spouse and all this other kind of business, there might be lawyers involved, but now we have two of you. There's two of you. Good luck to your husband. All right, and we're gonna give one of you a hug, and one of you an MS disease modifying therapy, and a hug, all right? And then we're gonna go live life and come back in five years. And then I could show you that the you that got the MS therapy and a hug did way better than the you that just had a hug. Which is nonsense, because not once has a spouse let me do that. And I don't know how. <laughs> so what do we do instead? We run clinical trials. So at the Boston Center for MS, we're running five clinical trials right now. I'm, I'm very proud to help bring clinical trials to Columbus, Ohio. And why do we do these clinical trials? So we can identify if medicines work. And we test them in groups of people with MS. And we find out because we divide and half of them take medicine A and half of them take medicine B. And then we see who did better. And then, based on that data, we extrapolate to you because those patients were a lot like you. 
And then we set our expectations of what we expect to have happen based on that. My point here is it can feel a little invisible. I'm taking my shot just the way you told me to. It's still, my, my side still hurts. I'm taking that infusion you told me I'm supposed to take. I still feel depressed. I'm taking the pill twice a day, right? And despite taking the pill twice a day, I'm still having problems in the bathroom. Those kids are already there, all right? We use symptomatic medicines to help chronic symptoms to improve the quality of your life. But the goal of the MS medicine is to slow the progression of disability moving forward. Do you know that there's actually a horrible travesty, there's a plague that only impacts MS neurologists around the world? This is true, I'm serious. It's a plague of misunderstanding called ageism, where some MS neurologists inappropriately stop medicine because you've reached a certain age. And that's crazy talk. And I think they fail to appreciate the invisible nature of the disease and the concept of therapeutic lag. And there's a patient who is very near and dear to my heart. And I have not seen her in a couple years. The last time I saw her, she was dandy as candy, taking a medicine through the vein once a month, rhymes with madamizumab. And she's doing very well, last time I saw her. And she called me, crying, and said, I need to see you. And so I brought her in with her husband. And she had a cane she didn't have a couple years ago. And she was unsteady with her walking. She wasn't a couple years ago, I remember. I said, tell me what's going on. What's going on with your madamizumab? She said, I aged out. I said, excuse me? She said, I aged out. The doctor told me that at my age, I'm not supposed to be on medicine anymore. And he stopped my medicine three years ago. And I said, what's happened? She goes, I've gotten a lot worse. He failed to appreciate the invisible nature of MS and the therapeutic lag. And guess what she's back on now? Madam Ismab. <laughs> my name's Aaron Boster. And I am so honored that you gave up your time to come and learn about MS with me. And today, I wanted to try to talk on the back of a pizza box about something that you can't see, but it doesn't make it not real. And that's the reality of multiple sclerosis. And if there's one take home message, it's you are a you expert. Don't let me tell you it's fine, you're okay. I'm not inside your body. So I have to listen to you when you say, nah. -uh. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Boster. This is the raffle. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> By the way, it was damn good pizza last night. Yeah, too. it was tasty pizza. <laughs> All right, so what we've got is we've got a lot of questions that came in virtually. All right, we're also still getting questions. We saw the screen lit up. We have Jill who's going to be taking care of all the virtual questions virtually, all right? And um, so if anybody that's watching right now, you have questions, please know that Jill will be answering them from afar, all right? And um, if you have any other questions, just please type them in there and we'll get to them. Plus, we have the ones on paper. Plus, I'm going to go around. You guys are not going to see me. You're only going to see Dr. Boster. I'm going to go around the room. If anybody has any questions, please put up your hands and let me acknowledge that I see you and then I'll get over by you as well. Okay? Thank you. Let's start with a question. Now right. guys, remember as we talk about questions, this is not clinic, and I can't give you an answer for a specific thing, so please frame your question in an open manner that that's would be right. applicable to anybody that's listening. That'll that's help right. everybody learn. What he's trying to say is it's not about you, so make it sound like it's somebody else, okay? For my friend. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay. All right, so first one. Person is writing, oh, and by the way, some of these questions might be something that the doctor already spoke about, but maybe the person didn't hear it, so um, we'll just have them answer it again. And this way you'll be learning it twice. Okay, how come lesions improve at times, but I'm still symptomatic all the time? That's an awesome question. So you are not a lesion. You are not an MRI. You are a human, right? The lesion is a picture of structure. Let me give you a quick example. All right, let's do an analogy. Now, I don't own any firearms, but let's pretend I did. Let's pretend I owned a double barrel, 12 gauge shotgun. <laughs> Boom, and I blow a hole in that wall right next to that sign. Now there's a giant hole in the wall right there. And I go to prison and everybody thinks it's really weird that Boster lost it on a Saturday, and they decide not to patch the hole. 
In fact, they put a frame around and say, this is where Dr. B lost it, right? And they just leave it there. And every time there's an event in here, people can look upon the hole. Now let's fast forward time. 20 years go by, I finally get out of prison. This building is starting to age. The materials in the building are starting to wear out. Let me ask you a question. Which wall falls first, point? It's the wall with the structural damage. That's not a new lesion, that's been there 20 years. When you have an MS attack and it causes a spot, you pay the devil's price, you pay twice. You pay at the time it happens and then your brain rewires and you regain some of that function back. You're back in the game, you're better. But as your brain ages, that spot wears out and the underpinnings of progression come from that area, we believe, in the absence of a new spot. I'll teach you a not secret. The goal is to not let the spots occur in the beginning so that there's nothing that wears out. Thank Great you. Question. So question from the audience. Is it true you can look back 10 years before diagnosis and see symptoms at that time? Five years. So, so do you guys familiar with the term prodrome? A prodrome, pro means the events that happen before a diagnosis. So there are prodromal illnesses, like where, where you, for example, you might um, get the flu and for a couple days you feel punky. You don't have a fever, you just don't feel very well. And then a couple days later you get a fever, you have the flu. So the feeling punky, that was the prodrome of the flu. There is a prodrome in multiple sclerosis. When we look at claims data, so when we look at giant populations of people and we look at their utilization of healthcare in the three to five years leading up to an MS diagnosis, it skyrockets. They're going to the ER, they're going to the ob -GYN, they're going to the psychiatrist, they're going to the belly doctor. Their medicine utilization is skyrocketing and what we see is it culminates in then the first symptoms of MS. I have racked my brain with a puzzle I can't solve because if I could figure that out ahead of time, I might be able to initiate treatment before you have the disease. The problem is I can only figure it out looking backwards. But yes, three to five years leading up to an MS diagnosis, meaning leading up to the first MS symptom. I'm not talking about the first MS symptom, I'm talking about stuff before that. And we're not smart enough yet to figure that out. Actually, wait, maybe there is a way to figure that out. And I didn't just think of this. There is a lab test called neurofilament light chain. Right? And neurofilament light chain used to only be obtained through spinal fluid. And so if I could just draw a spinal fluid every three months, haha. -ha. But now, neurofilament light chain can be drawn through blood. It's not commercially available. I can't do this in clinic yet. We can do it in research. And your neurofilament light chain level correlates with your disease. And so it goes up months before you have an attack. When you go on a medicine, it goes down. If you go on a better medicine, it goes down lower. And as you progress in neurological disability, it slowly increases. And it's not prime time yet, but I imagine a world where children of people with MS are screened with neurofemal light chain. And if we see that it's rising, maybe we can intervene beforehand. That might be a way to do it. Great, thank you. Virtually, we're gonna ask Jill to ask the next virtual question. Hi, Dr. Buster. Um, Hi. I have a question here that is from Michael. And Michael wants to know, can the MS hug be on one side only? Absolutely, absolutely. So again, remember I was saying the MS hug is caused by a lesion on your spinal cord, which triggers the nerves to tell the muscles between your ribs to contract. Well, it doesn't have to do it symmetrically. And so sometimes you'll only have it on the left. Sometimes you only have it on the right. Or sometimes you may only have it in the front. So that is absolutely seen all the time. That's real. Good Michael question, also Michael, thank wants you. I to know what is the best relief for the MS hug? The, the best relief is to take medicines to prevent the attack from occurring. The second best relief is to use medicines to stabilize the cells in the spinal cord so they don't fire inappropriately. And we typically use medicines that were invented for other purposes to do that. The drug of choice is a drug called carbamazepine or Tegretol. It's an old seizure medicine. It's not given for seizures in this case, it's given to stabilize the cells in the spinal cord. I'll tell you a super awesome trick for refractory MS hug, Botox. You have to go to a master Botoxer because if they, if they mess up, they pop your lung. But if they can poison just a little bit, those muscles, they don't contract and then you don't have MS hug. 
And so there are ways to treat it. Good question. Great. Next one. How effective or how useful is an MRI when a patient can no longer have contrast due to kidney dysfunction? So the question is saying, when we obtain an MRI, if we get the whole everything, it includes a period of time where they pull you out of the gantry and they shoot this white stuff in your arm, makes you feel like, real warm like you're gonna wet your pants. Then they shove you back in the tube and they take extra pictures. And those are pictures where we've given your body contrast. And the contrast flows through your blood vessels and it lights up the blood vessels. And if there's a new MS lesion, new as in right now, the dye leaks out temporarily into the brain tissue. And so it lights up like a Christmas tree light bulb. And it tells us there's a new lesion now. Those lesions only stay enhancing for two weeks, maybe four weeks at the most. Now, some patients for various reasons, the most common being kidney dysfunction, should not have contrast. It's still extremely useful to get an MRI. I would submit to you that about 85% of the information I want on a standard screening scan, I can get without contrast. If I can get contrast, I learn more, but if I can't get contrast, I still learn a whole bunch. And so I'm okay if for whatever reason we can't get contrast. I still find the scan very, very powerful and very useful. Great, thank you. Next question, I had to change my glasses four times in one year, then five years later, I went blind. Was that the beginning of my MS? Almost impossible to know, to be, to be honest with you. Almost impossible to know. We might ferret it out based on the kind of changes. It may be related, although that sounds a little bit like the prodrome that I was talking about. But at, at today, I don't have a clever way of figuring that out. Okay, virtually, we gotta take a question. Robert says, my muscles are, are weakened by MS. Can they be restrengthened? Yes. So if you think about like, my massive arm here, okay? And in that giant bicep. Why is my wife laughing? Um, so, so if we think about like a muscle, right? The brain is connected to the spinal cord, which is connected to a nerve, to the muscle, to tell the muscle to contract, right? So if you have a knife that cuts your bicep, your muscle's damaged and it doesn't work. That's not the problem in MS. The problem is in MS is the computer that tells the muscle to move isn't sending the full message. Maybe it's only sending a 50% message. So when you say move your arm, the arm is learning just to do 50%, and so it's weak. It's not weak because the muscle's weak, it's weak because the input to the muscle is weak. But there is still input. There's still a connection because you can move it some, and if you can move it, you can strengthen it. Now I'm not saying it's easy to strengthen it, because there's all kinds of complicating factors. But that is why God invented neurophysical therapy. Neurophysical therapists are my very best friend because they are wizards at not why, but how. They don't get so much into why is the person having this problem, but how can they make it better? Now, Stuart gave me the signal of, geez, Louise, Aaron, you're really verbose today. Sorry, let's go on to the next question. Uh, you know, we don't mind it, but we have like a lot of questions. We could always go back later, right? All right, is there a difference between a cramp or a spasm? Yes, so both are parts of spasticity. A cramp is a visible contraction of the muscle belly. It's a charley horse. It's when your leg locks up and you drop to the ground and squeeze it and try to get it to relax. That's a cramp. A spasm is a visible bouncing of the muscle. So very often you take the shoe off and the foot bounces, that's a spasm. They're different. They're both teaching me that you have spasticity. And what is it that is caused during the night when a person's hamstring or ankle or calf or foot just go to a painful oh. level? So spasticity, Cramps, spasms, and limbs that are hard to bend. Spasticity are always made worse under two conditions. When it's cold and when you're still. So why do I hear most complaints at night? Because at night we're not moving. We're laying in bed or sitting on the lazy boy recliner or what happened, but we're not moving. And so the time that you are the most still of your life is when you're asleep. And so as you sleep and as your muscles are still, they have an increased risk of spasming and it can wake you up with significant pain. Great, thank you. Next one, I have MS and I heard that MS is not genetic, but I have several family members with aggressive MS. What can you tell me? So 
when we say the word genetic, we typically, in common culture, think about genetic conditions like um, sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis, where if you have it, a certain number of your children are going to have it. Like these, those are like genetic conditions. MS is not a genetic condition in the same fashion. But if you have MS, your first three relatives' risk to get MS skyrockets. So here in Ohio, the general population's risk of MS is 1 in 350. That's the general population. If you have MS, your child's risk, your brother's risk, and your dad's risk is 1 in 40. And so you can see clusters of autoimmunity. Now, there are some families, like the person who asked the question described, where they have it, auntie has it, brother has it, and their son has it. There is a cluster. And for that family, it does appear to be genetic. And what it teaches you is that we're not as smart as we think we are, and we still don't fully understand this stuff. Virtually, can we take a question, please? I know you spoke some, and I think it's worth repeating, about um, DMTs. And I have two questions that are very similar. The first one is, is it advisable to stop DMTs after 50 years of age? And the second is, if DMTs haven't been used, should a senior start taking them now? And which ones? Thank you for the question. I feel strongly that we should never, ever use DMTs after death. I think it's dumb. Like, I think it's just a stupid idea. Because the medicines have not been studied after death, and they don't work after death, and you can't even get them in. And so that is a very clear spot where we should not use disease-modifying therapy. And I, I feel passionately about that. And I would be happy to argue with anyone that feels different. But until you're dead, I have a question. Do you have any nervous functions you like? For example, swallowing, orgasming, seeing, wiggling your thumb, feeling your leg. If there are any nervous functions that you like and would like to keep, then you're at risk because you still have an immune system which can attack those nervous things. When we have studied older people, and Lord God, 50 is not old. 50 is the new 30. <clears throat> When we've studied older people, they are less likely to have an attack, but they're less likely to recover from the attack. And they are at higher risk of progression. And the MS disease modifying therapies decrease the risk of attack and decrease the likelihood of progression. And so I want you to stay on a therapy. Now, the second half of the question, if you present and have never been on a medicine, I can change your life for the better by putting you on a medicine. And I don't care how old you are. So if I diagnose you with MS and you're still alive, it's fair to offer you a disease-modifying therapy so that we can slow cognitive decline and slow accumulation of spots and brain damage so that we can slow neurological disability so that we can help you live your very best life despite having MS. Thank you. Question from the audience. Why can the world or the United States solve or create a medication for COVID so quickly, but research or progress for MS seems to be moving so slow. Because killing a virus is not hard. Because MS is really complicated. What we did to develop COVID-19 vaccines was revolutionary. It was revolutionary. The people that developed the mRNA vaccines will win Nobel Peace Prize, and every school should be named after them because they've saved hundreds of millions of lives. But it's not a hard problem. It's one virus, and we can study it. We understand the unique coronavirus. We know all 26 proteins. We know how it replicates. We know how it enters. We know what the spike does. We know what the neurocapsid does. And we figured out a way to beat it. It's a very simple way to beat it, and it works. MS is really complicated. It's way, 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 way more complicated than that. And there's so much about MS that we don't know yet. So the conspiracy theory that doctors in cahoots with governments, in cahoots with pharma companies know the answer and they're hiding it is false. That's simply not true. We're still trying to figure out MS. Let me, let me make a point. When I went to med school, MS, I was taught, was only a T-cell disease. The adaptive immune system is B and T-cells. We told just T-cells, that's it. That was wrong. A couple years ago, we discovered that treating B-cells works really well to help MS. So now we said, okay, well, MS involves the B-cells and the T-cells. Well, now guess what? 
we're starting to study the other half of the immune system that we've never studied before called the innate immune system. Many of the clinical trials that I'm running right now have medicines that impact the innate immune system, microglia, things that we've never been able to impact. And we don't know what's gonna happen. That's why we're doing clinical trials. So the answer to the question is because MS is way more complicated, we're not there yet. I wanna reassure you that my friends and colleagues around the world are aggressively trying to answer that question. I have close personal friends of mine, their life's work is geared towards trying to answer that question. It's ongoing. There's a lot of people trying really hard right now. Great, thank you for that response. We'll go virtually again. My mobility has gotten much worse since starting Ocrevus. I was previously on Copaxone for 14 years. I have read that a number of people have had increased mobility issues after starting Ocrevus. Is there a possible correlation? So I can't answer specifically for you, but I want to point out something that you said. You are 15 to 17 years into your disease. MS, even treated, progresses over time in some people. Is it possible that it has nothing to do with the fact that you switch medicines? Is it possible that the disease has progressed? It's an unanswered question. Is it possible that for you, Ocrevus or some other medicine is not the right drug? Yeah, that is possible. My point here is, is that it's confusing and complicated and there's multiple different variables. And again, because we can't do my cloning experiment, it's a real hard question to answer. Thank you. All right, so a person asked something similar and that is that um, they've just moved into secondary progressive phase and want to know how it will look different and how the doctor even knows based on an MRI. So you cannot diagnose secondary progressive MS with an MRI, period. Next paragraph. So I don't use the term secondary progressive in my clinic. I take care of thousands of people. None of them have secondary progressive MS. Not a single one, isn't that weird? You either have primary progressive MS or you have a relapsing form of MS. A relapsing form of MS, and this is not Aaron making up words, this is facts. A relapsing form of MS means you have MS and you've had at least one relapse. That is a relapsing form of MS. Now sometimes people with a relapsing form of MS can develop secondary progression. I'm not mincing words, I'm being accurate with my language. You still have a relapsing form of MS. You are still at risk of having relapses. You in addition have some progression of neurological disability. The medicines we use treat both. So how does that change stuff? It doesn't really change stuff. Now, if we're seeing breakthrough disease, if we're seeing concern, we might escalate your therapy because you have a relapsing form of MS. And so I wanna treat that relapsing form of MS. I personally don't like the term secondary progressive MS because there's a stigma attached to it. Because there was an era where we thought we couldn't impact the disease when you hit that so-called milestone or benchmark. And there's been doctors and insurance companies that say, oh honey, sorry, you're an SPMS, bye. Which is, which is wrong and false. And so I don't like to use terms that label people and stigmatize people, but don't help the plan. Thank you. So the same person wants to know how the doctor will even know changing from relapse remitting going forward or getting worse, how will the doctor be able to identify it? There are three ways that we assess how you're doing. Way number one, we ask you. Remember, you're a U expert? So we can just ask you like how you're doing. Anything that you can't do last year that or something you could do last year that you can't do this year? What's going on? What's new? Anything worse? Anything improved? Anything new? So we can ask you. That's one way we can learn. And asking you also includes those patient report outcome measures I have you fill out, all that stuff. The second way is we can examine you. So when you come to the Boster Center for MS, we run you through the MS Olympics, right? We make you run down the hallway and we have you do the pegs. Even if you cuss and scream, we still have you do the pegs and we have you do the, the the uh, vision test and we have you do the matching test. Those are validated measures to screen for progression of neurological disability. That stuff's serious, it's very, very important. We also do traditional neurological testing with this stuff and this stuff <laughs> and that's another way that I learn about you. Because I might see something on exam that you don't know about, you don't notice it because you've gotten used to it. The third way is we get pictures. We get MRIs, we get MRIs, we get bladder scans, we get OCTs, we do testing with pictures, and all three of those ways are how we measure how you're doing. And that doesn't change whether you've been labeled with 
CIS or RRMS or SPMS or hoobity hobbity. You have multiple sclerosis and that's how we're going to measure and see how you're doing. I dare you to use hoobity hobbity during a neuroimmunologic lecture on a Saturday morning. Virtually. Next question. Uh, this is from Paula. I have had symptoms for numerous years and recently diagnosed with a progressive form of MS, unknown as of yet. Started Casimta and Baclofen. My question, why do I still have this feeling as, as though my brain feels like it will explode out of my skull? So I don't know the answer to that question. But what I'm hearing is this person is relatively newly diagnosed and all of her symptoms are not yet addressed. And so if you have exploding brain syndrome, I would bring that to the attention of your brain doctor. And if you don't like exploding brain syndrome, I would say, hey, can you help me make it not feel like that? Because there's probably a pill for that ill and some work that needs to be done. So I don't think we've adequately addressed symptoms. The medicine that that person's taking is a disease modifying therapy, which is fantastically wonderful to do that but that won't address exploding head syndrome. We have to use other lotions and potions to help with that. Thank you. All right, next question. A person is asking uh, or stating that my neuro said that skin's cancer is the only type of cancer that Ocrevus can cause. Is that true or not? No, because Ocrevus has no association with cancer. Thank you. Another next question. I've been having pain, pins, needles, and needle-like feelings. Is, there, is that an invisible symptom? I think that sensory symptoms are invisible. You know they're there, they're real, but if someone looks at you, honey, you look fantastic. They can't see it. So I would consider that an invisible but real symptom. Yes. Virtual question. What is your opinion, this is for Michael, on stem cell transplant therapy? So Michael wants to know about hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So stem cell transplantation is not a treatment, it's a procedure. It's not a medicine, it's a, it's a procedure where we harvest your stem cells and then we murder you. We give you lethal doses of chemotherapy and radiation and if we didn't intervene you would die. And then before you die we give you back the stem cells and hope they take and then we keep you boy in the bubble until you redevelop an immune system and hope you don't succumb to infection with a goal of rebooting your immune response. It is an exciting, growing, developing area of MS neurology that is not prime time yet. And so I strongly recommend people to avoid stem cell tourism. Right now, if you have 50,000 extra dollars, you can go to an exotic location like India or Mexico or Chicago and get your bone marrow swapped out, maybe. But it's not done in a clinical trial environment where it's guaranteed to be safe and supervised and monitored. And that makes me nervous. I've had situations where a patient did that and they went somewhere exotic and they got a stem cell transplant and they came back to me and they said, okay, take care of me. And I said, wow, can I see the protocol? Well, I don't have a protocol. They didn't give you the protocol? What medicines do they use? Well, I don't know. You don't know what medicines they used. Well, did they give you a monitoring program? No, they just said to go back to you and you'll take care of it. Wow, that's scary. And so I think stem cell transplantation is an exciting area of research. And I think before I bow out of this field, it will have a place at the table. Right now, it should only be done in proper clinical trials conducted with a ethical guideline of, attached. Great, thank you. Now, since I've heard there's a lot of virtual questions, I'm gonna to have to refer back to our virtual questionnaire and let her ask them. I've had a couple of episodes of major depression since my MS diagnosis. The rest of the time, if I'm untreated, I tend to have a mild depression. Now I'm on medication and it is working. But what is the depression prognosis for people with MS with my kind of history? It's very good. So whereas people impacted by MS are at higher risk to develop depression, they're not medically refractory to being treated. Most people, we can, we can knock out depression, we can manage it. Now, over this last year, I had to become a better psychiatrist. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm an MS neurologist, but I had to become a better psychiatrist because nobody could leave their house and nobody could get in to see a psychiatrist. And with a global viral pandemic, a lot of people were really hella depressed. It was a very serious issue. 
And so I have upped my game. I read a lot about psychiatry and I now mix and match medicines. I feel like a wizard. We're at a little of this with a little of that and some of this on top and we make it work. But it's been working. So the outcome and the prognosis for depression and MS is really good, even if your dumb neurologist is trying to figure out how to play psychiatrist. Great, thank you for that. All right, so next one we have, um, can you tell us what's the best way to treat pain and spasticity? No, because I don't have enough information. So we have to know what kind of pain, where's the pain, what you've tried, what you haven't tried, what makes it better, what makes it worse. We have to understand the spasticity, the, the degree of spasticity, the location of the spasticity, the trigger of the spasticity, what we've tried, what hasn't worked, what's worked, what's made it work. And then once we know those things, we can start. What I can tell you is that I have not yet run out of options to treat pain and spasticity. And I've been doing this job for over a decade and a half. So as long as you're willing to work with me and keep trying stuff, we can find a way to improve pain and spasticity. Now, if you listen to my answer, I didn't say remove, I said improve, because I'm not proud. I might not be able to get rid of it, but I can make it better. I haven't failed in doing that yet. Okay, virtually again, please. I have two questions that seem to be different, but somewhat related. The first one is, how can lesions on the spine impact multiple sclerosis? And the second is, can one recover from lesions on or by the cerebellum? So the second question first, yes. The first question second. The spinal cord takes all the information from the supercomputer down this very narrow channel, which is thinner than my two fingers. The spinal cord is not very wide. It's like a wire. And if it gets damaged, all of the information from the brain going down to the foot risks being muddled. All the information from the foot going back up to the brain risks getting muddled. And so things might not work right. You can have a transverse myelitis, a damage to the spinal cord, and not be able to feel from that level down, lose bowel and bladder function, and lose leg function, strength and sensation, because all of that stuff is perfectly normal in the brain. And when the brain says, kick him, the message says, kick him, and it goes down the spinal cord and says, kick him, until it gets to that lesion, and then it says, nothing. And so nothing happens. So spinal cord lesions are more likely to cause neurological symptoms than brain lesions. Great, thank you. All right, question from the audience. Person wants to know, with this being such a great program and being discussed by a great speaker, how does this kind of information get to other neurologists around the country who are not known for this kind of information? Remember how I said I try to really hard not to guess what other doctors think because it confuses me? That's still true. In my, in my mind, there's a couple ways that you can help influence a clinician. One is you can invite him to come out and talk to other clinicians. So something that MS neurologists do, sometimes we participate in advisory boards, like think tanks where we get together and we talk amongst each other. And that's a great way to share information and up people's games. There's continued medical education where we can go back to the well and learn stuff and up our game. Patients teach us things. You guys teach me things all day. A week doesn't go by that somebody doesn't bring me a research paper and I learn some stuff. Happens all the time. Hey, what about this drug? Never heard of that drug. I think I learned about it. But I want to remind you that a doctor is like a plumber or an electrician or anyone else. And there's plenty of us. And if you don't jive with your doc, that's not your fault or his fault. That's just you just don't jive. And so it's fair for you to go seek out a second opinion. That's fair, right? It's your body, it's your brain, it's your one life that you get to live. You're the you expert. And if you feel like your needs aren't being met, you're allowed to say, hey, that's not working out for me. I want you to know more. Patients often inform and educate doctors, which I think is brilliant. So that works out great for those that are in urban America, but what about those that are in rural America? The interwebs. That's right. So the interwebs are really cool. I love the interwebs. So it dawned on me a long time ago that when I wrote my highfalutin fancy pants neuroimmunologic papers that none of you read them. Right? I would write all these papers that had letters and numbers and stuff and it was all really cool and took me months to write. And 18 other doctors thought it was awesome. And five of them said, Aaron, good job. 
which was not something I cared about because I was trying to help up your game. It also dawned on me at the same time that every single family in my clinic, without exception, has Facebook. Every single family has Facebook. Nowadays, you have Facebook and Instagram and the Twitters and the YouTubes and the tickety tickities and all these other things. But y'all have it on your phone. And so I started to make videos when patients didn't show up to clinic. I literally would take my phone and just talk into it and I would say, watch, Ray Charles, and I would just send it off without editing it. And it was the most cringy video I've ever made in my life when I look back at it. But I was throwing it out on the interwebs. Now, I have a YouTube channel now for six years, and there's 32,000 subscribers, and I make a video every Monday. And those videos are made for you. They're intended to up your game, to energize, to empower, to educate. And that's just free out on the interwebs because you might not want to hear what I have to say during a clinic visit. You may need to hear it at three o'clock in the morning. One more comment. I'm not the only person educating on the interwebs. Guys, look back at that camera. There's a bunch of people in their homes right now learning and I think that's awesome and I love you, Mwah, thank you. And MSVs and News is an excellent example of a repository of the latest and greatest cutting edge information in MS housed in their websites and their Facebook pages and on their YouTube channels. So another way to up your game is to learn on the interwebs. Thank you, I won't deny that either. All right, so here's another one. Let's go even a step further. Rural America, when I say rural America, I'm talking about remote rural America. There is no internet signal near a lot of the United States. I mean, realistically, is more areas of the United States where there is no internet signal than there is internet signal. And there are a lot of people with multiple sclerosis living in those areas and seeing maybe a general doctor as their neurologist. How can we get better information to these people? So, I mean, Stuart, one thing that you guys at MS Visa News have been doing is by bringing programs to rural America. So that's pretty awesome. Let's give them a round of applause for doing that. Sometimes it's fair to travel. Sometimes it's worth it to travel a couple hours to see a specialist. It doesn't have to be MS. And so we have people that fly in to see us from all kinds of different locations. They come in, they spend the night, they see us, they get their MRIs, they get their treatments, then they go home. And so I joke with people, let's have MS twice a year. The rest of the year, you do you. Give me two days. Come to Columbus, let me help you. And so I, I think that's fair. You're worth it. And we co-manage a lot of people. So they have a wonderful doctor back home, whether that be an internist or a family practice doctor or an, a neurologist or an MS neurologist, but they co-manage and they come visit us and we help take care of them and we collaborate. And that works very well. That's an option. Great, thank you. Virtual. I think you discussed this uh, briefly earlier, but Maria is asking for you to please talk more about pruritus, yeah. itching? Yep, so pruritus is a doctor word for itching, right? And oftentimes people don't associate itching with MS, but it is a symptom of, it's a, it's a pain syndrome. And there are centers in your brain and spinal cord which if affected can cause a pathologic itching. There's no rash, but it feels like there is. And it's typically a very refractory itching. It's very, very hard to manage. And it, it's amazing to me that people will d discuss they've had pathologic itching for years and they never told anyone because they didn't realize it was related to their MS. They also didn't realize that you can treat it with neuropathic pain medicines. So the pain medicines that we use off-label like gabapentin or pregabalin or uh, topiramate or duloxetine or any of these medicines that help with pain can help with itching. We can also use lotions and creams pain creams that we rub on the area to numb the skin. So there's things that we can do, but it starts off with knowing that MS can cause pain and that sometimes the pain manifests as pathologic itching. That's real. Thank you, question from the audience. My equilibrium is off. I fell recently, I just blacked out, I was just walking, and where is this disconnect? So, Walking is a very, very complex function, actually. Like a bunch of bunch of things have to happen for us to walk successfully. And if any of them are goofy, we might go to ground. That's a very complex and appropriate question, and it's gonna take some careful attention. 
That's someone that I need to see in my office and we need to go on a walk. I literally need to watch you walk. I need to watch you balance. I need to watch what happens on one leg. I need to watch what happens when you stand up. We're gonna have to do some stuff to figure it out. If I listed all the different problems with walking, you would be trying to get home to go to bed tonight and I wouldn't, I'd say, wait, wait, I'm not done because there's a host of things. And that's where as a team member, we need to partner and we need to work on that to figure out what the problems with an S are because it's probably not one thing, it's probably several things. And we can start to pick them apart. For example, maybe you have lightheadedness from a cardiovascular problem that has nothing to do with MS. Or maybe you have an inner ear problem from MS that's making you feel like you're spinning. Or maybe your foot goes into a cramp and you stumbled and smacked your head. There's a host of things that can happen. And so that's why we went to neurology school so we can work with you to help piece them apart and try to figure that piece out. Once we can figure out what the problems are, we can start to treat it. Great, thank you for that. Now, we have about 10 questions remaining, all right? Virtually, in-house, and previously received, all right? Short so answers, gonna, Aaron, got yeah, it, Yeah, we're go. gonna ask you just go with the short answers, right? But I have a funny feeling that this next one, and this is probably a continuation of the program you did the other night, uh, when we did that virtual uh, one on sexual problems for MS, for men with MS. But this one writes, I'm a guy who is having sexual problems due to not being able to feel my package. What do you suggest? So there's lots of different ways that we can have difficulty with sex. And one of them is lack of feeling. So right now, I'm not using much more than my standard indoor voice. Right? There's not a lot of extra commotion in the room. If all of you answered cell phone calls at the same time and I was still trying to be heard, I would start yelling. I would need to raise my voice because there's so much interference between your ear and my mouth that I would need more input to help you hear it. And the same thing can happen with the down there's. Because when the down there's are stimulated, there's damage to the spinal cord. So as the message goes up, it dies along the way and your brain never learns what's going on down there. And so we can do the equivalent of yelling. We can provide overdrive stimulation. Tip number one, water-based lubricant. Why? It increases skin sensitivity. Tip number two, plug in the wall, Hitachi Magic Wand, vibrator. Head of the penis, shaft of the penis, behind the testicles, vulva, tush, I don't care where you put it. Hold it there and it'll provide overdrive stimulation. <laughs> And that can be adequate that you can feel your junk because it forces the message up to your brain. Your brain says, oh, oh, it's Friday. Great. Okay, Karen asks, why do people randomly get foot drop after having a mess? Got it while on Ocrevus makes walking even more challenging. So when you have damage to the brain and spinal cord, it can occur anywhere. But if you think about the thing that's the farthest away from your brain, it's your foot. And damage to anywhere along the motor pathway could result in a foot problem. So you're more likely to have a foot problem with MS than a hand problem. Because the hand can only be affected from the brain down to the spinal cord here. But the brain and spinal cord can also affect the foot, so can the rest of the spinal cord. My point is, there's more opportunities to develop foot drop than almost anything else. And so over time, as you have individual hits to your nervous system, it can culminate in weakness, and that weakness is more likely to be lower extremity than upper extremity, just because of anatomy. Virtual again, please. Regarding hand tremors, which feel like arthritic, while the tremor horribly, while they tremor horribly with shooting pain throughout the muscles and joints, could there be an exercise to reduce that? Yes. What would it be? Depends. I don't have enough information. We'd start by having to see what you could and couldn't do. We'd have to see what your limitations are. I might even get an occupational therapist to come in and help me to really ferret out how to make it better. Not enough information, but the take home is, yeah, we can treat that. Okay, next for me. Um, please provide information on new drugs for primary progressive MS. What's to come? There's a lot to come. One of the clinical trials we're running right now is studying a molecule called BTK inhibitor. It affects microglia in the brain. We've never been able to do that in the history of MS. And we're testing it in primary progressive MS. There are three patients that have enrolled in the entire world. One is in Bulgaria, two are at the Boston Center for MS. 
They are patients with PPMS right here in Columbus, Ohio. Now, when that drug is proven to work in PPMS, it will be because people with MS in this city volunteer their body to help figure it out. And how about we commend them? That's a big deal. That's a really big deal. What can you tell us the benefit of the BTKI over what's happening and what's being done right now? So this, uh, this new molecule, you're going to hear lots and lots more about over the next couple of years. There are currently five uh, manufacturers of MS drugs that have all created molecules that they're testing right now. It's, it's, there's like a wave of new therapeutics coming down the line. Real quick, BTK inhibitors are pills that you swallow. They currently exist to treat various kinds of cancers. We're not using it for that. We're using it for MS. They do two things that are weird, but I like weird. Weird thing number one, they block B cell signal without murdering B cells. That's neat. We don't know how to do that yet. Number two, they turn off naughty activated microglia, these cells in the brain that we've never been able to impact before. Now we can impact them and turn them off. And that looks like it might be better to treat progression than anything else. Stay tuned. Lots to come. Can you redefine what it is that you just said about the B-cell killer or not killer? Yeah, so, so there are some really, really good medicines out there that kill B-cells. So there's the O word and the K word and the R word. And these medicines, they, they kill B-cells. And that's a great way to treat MS. But there's issues sometimes if you murder B-cells. Like you might not want to murder them all. And so this BTK inhibition molecule blocks the signal of the B cell like, la, 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 I can't hear you, but it doesn't murder the B cell. And so that's a cool trick. And these drugs, these BTK inhibitors, do not look like they increase the risk for infection, whereas some of the molecules that kill B cells might. And so that's slick. Great, thank you. Virtual. Uh, this question is from Robert. For an annual MRI, how long do you take to review it? So d if Robert means how long does it take me to look at it, um, that's not very long because I look at MRIs every day for the last 20 years. If Robert means how long do we spend looking at it, the better part of a visit. When, you know, so if I have a half an hour with you and it's an MRI day, that's going to be 15, 20 minutes of what we do, oftentimes. Best case scenario, I pull up your new MRI and your old MRI, and we flip through each sequence, and I show you the before and after, and we look for new spots, and we look for new lesions, we look for enlarged lesions, we look for enhancing lesions, and we look at the brain volume. Sometimes it's faster, but that's a major aspect of that visit in my clinic. And Thank if you. there's no changes, then... If there's no changes, then we do high fives and we do hugs. It doesn't mean there's nothing wrong with you, but it means that there's no new structural damage. So if I took a picture of your house and I compared it to last year and all the windows are intact, I don't know if you're in an argument with your husband, but I know that all the windows are intact. Does that mean that everything in your life is grand? No. Is it good that your house looks the same as it did last year? Absolutely. And so it's one piece of information. Remember I said there's three things. What you tell me, what I see on exam, and what I see on the MRI. Having a good MRI is always good. It just doesn't mean it's the only thing going on. Okay, but if I tell you that my symptoms are getting worse, why? So there's lots of reasons. Remember how we talked about the hole in the wall? It was there for 20 years before the wall fell down. There was no new hole. So having a good MRI is good. If you have new symptoms, that doesn't negate the fact the MRI is good. It just means we have to focus on new symptoms. The point here is those three things do not have to jive. So you can have a bad MRI and feel right as rain with a normal standard exam. I'm still going to be upset with MS. You can have a great looking MRI and be doing worse. I'm still going to be upset with MS. But it doesn't take away from the fact that not having new brain damage on an MRI is always good. All right, we have another question virtually. That'll be done with the virtuals and then we'll finish up what we have from previous and call it a day, right? We have a lot of good questions coming up. Paula wants to know if you can please discuss more about optic neuritis. I can, Paula, but Stu wants me to be kind of quick. So the optic nerve connects the noggin to the eyeball. And when light comes in the eyeball, it's interpreted through the optic nerve, which is like a wire, to the back of the brain. The optic nerve is thinner than my pinky. And if there's an, uh, a lesion, inflammation, it takes that nerve out, you can't see very well. It's literally like a traffic jam on a highway. And so if you think of the electricity as like the cars going up and down, there's a traffic jam, it gets stopped. 
So light goes in your eye, but the message doesn't get to the back of your head. Your eye actually sees something, but your brain says there's nothing there because it can't interpret it. It's kind of like if you unplugged your monitor and typed on your computer, your computer's working. You just don't know it because you can't see it. But when you type in some stuff, the computer does what it told you to do. Just the monitor was out. I've never used that example before. <laughs> Proud of yourself? Yeah, I was kind of happy. Great. That was my happy dance. Okay, awesome. All right, next one is from a newly diagnosed person who was diagnosed with progressive MS. Doesn't know what's going on with his or her body anymore. How can he or she recognize when there is a need to go to the hospital or call on a specialist? And how can he or she recognize what is truly a new symptom or a flare-up? So that is an excellent and appropriate question. And every single person in this room knows exactly what they're talking about because all of us were newly diagnosed at one point in time. I'll tell you all the exact same thing. It takes two years. I've done this job for a while now. It takes about two years for you to feel comfortable in your own skin with this disease. Not one year, not five years, but two years. And over the course of those first two years, you're going to be drinking from a fire hose and hearing and seeing and thinking weird things. And it can be confusing. And you don't have a translator yet. I want to volunteer to be your translator. So when you go to church and say, I just got diagnosed with PPMS, someone in the pew next to you say, oh my God, honey, I used to live in Georgia and I had a neighbor down in Georgia and she had a pet goat. And that goat was friends with a dog, didn't know the dog. The dog got MS and died. <laughs> that has nothing to do with you. Now they were trying to be nice, but it didn't really help. And so then you call me and say, am I gonna blow up because this dog was friends with a goat down in Georgia with this woman's neighbor? No, but you don't know that yet. So bring it to me and tell me about it and I will translate it for you. For real, 614-304-3444, <laughs> call us. Great, thank you for that. All right, here's our last question of the day and it's a multi-part question. So it's about CBD, it's about cannabis. Yay! It's about oh. the creams, whether from CBD or THC. We'll start with that one first. Which is better for a person who is experiencing leg pain, spasticity, or otherwise to put on their skin, THC cream or CBD cream? The data is absent. So there's no science to answer that question, quite honestly. The answer is what happens when you rub it on your skin. So I have some patients, CBD is a miracle. Like for them, it helps their neuropathic pain immensely. I have other people that swear it does nothing. And why? It's because different people respond differently to therapies and, and drugs and medicines and whatnot. I have some people that find that their symptoms are not adequately managed by CBD alone and they need THC in some ratio. Other people find that not to be the case. The science is not there, which is frustrating for a nerd like me but instead I have to listen to what patients experience and I have to help them work through it. And we have to try to find what works. Medical marijuana, which is FDA approved nowhere, but is legalized here in Ohio in a medical format, has helped a lot of my patients actually. I was a naysayer, but then I started to listen. And I'll tell you honestly what happened. A bunch of seven year old ladies who don't know each other started to all tell me the same darn thing. Dr. Boster, my grandson gave me this doobie, and if I smoke it, I don't need your Lyrica. And I thought, are all these 70-year-old ladies like getting together in a circle and saying, let's all tell Aaron the same thing? I don't think so. I think they discovered something. And so I started to listen to them. And I have found that medical marijuana in the right context helps people with MS with irritability, with insomnia, with spasticity and pain. And it comes in all kinds of different flavors and shapes and sizes, and it's not for everyone, but it's a, it's a tool that we can now sometimes use here in Ohio. It's pretty neat. Okay, the second and third part for this is discussing the, whether it be smoking from a joint or a pipe, or doing vape or doing gummies, what's the best time of day for a person that's in pain most of the day to be using it because he or she does not want to overuse and still has to work? So that's a very, very complex question. First of all, in Ohio, medical marijuana card does not protect you against your employer. And the ADA will not protect you. 
So if you seek out a medical marijuana card from a licensed recommender, it's legal in the state of Ohio, and you go legally into a dispensary and purchase something that helps your pain, and you're drug tested and they have a policy against it, they can fire you and no one will help you. That's true. And so I want you to know that. That's a big deal. As a sidebar, if you have a medical marijuana card, it negates a concealed carry. Because a concealed carry is a federal law that says you cannot use a controlled substance. And so I just want people to know that because sometimes people have a concealed carry, they don't wanna give up. Welcome to Ohio. What we use really depends on the goals of what we're trying to accomplish and how you respond. Now, I'll share with you that I am not a big proponent of asking people with MS to take a carbon-based plant matter and light it on fire and then suck in the smoke because it's pro-inflammatory to the lungs. A vape is when you heat it up below the level of combustion and you suck in the vapor, not the smoke. And I think it's still pro-inflammatory, but way less so than smoking. An edible, which is like a THC gummy or something, those have no inflammatory effects to the lungs. And so from a lung safety inflammation standpoint, I find the edibles to be a little bit of a safer option. And if we're not gonna use an edible and we need something that works fast, because an edible can take an hour and a half to kick in, then we need to use something fast. But I don't personally recommend a blunt. I recommend a vape pen or my fave is a tincture. Tincture is an old apothecary term. It's liquid, you put it up in a dropper, drop it in your mouth. I'm gonna tell you a quick story about a patient of mine who had medically refractory trigeminal neuralgia, excruciating pain. He would try not to cry because crying hurt his face. Like seriously. And he couldn't take a medicine because he couldn't open his mouth to swallow. And his wife would try to put a vape pen in his mouth and he would cry because it hurt. So we were able to get THC tincture and she would slip the little eyedropper in his mouth and deliver the liquid and within moments his pain stopped and that's pretty slick. My point here is we have to do some investigations and there's no science to guide us. And so I would just encourage you to work with a medical marijuana recommender that knows her stuff so that you can kind of navigate through with them. Awesome answers, awesome program. Dr. Boster, of course, have to thank you for being here and thank you everybody for being out there. Thank you guys. In the audience, virtually, I want to thank I want to thank our virtual audience for being on with us today. And just remember, you could always check back with our calendar, see all the events that we are doing week to week, and, um, and we'll just keep on going forward, all right? So you just visit the website and you'll see what's going on. All right, we're going to say goodbye to the virtual. I got to keep all the locals, though, for a little bit, all right? And we're going to say adios, see you all soon, and you all have a great day, and be well. <laughs>